going back historically, let's put it this way, uh, our research uh, project was based on trying to answer the question, why did cells proliferate? And uh, uh, as happens sometimes in uh, science, you start on a subject without knowing what the future will bring. And uh, we started in 1970 uh, uh, on the subject of uh, control of cell proliferation of uh, cells that were sensitive to the female uh, sex hormones. Estradiol specifically. And in 1979, by the end of the 1970s, we realized that uh, the premises that we have been adopting were probably wrong. And we changed in, uh, in the meantime our premises. And because of uh, the uniqueness of our approach, we were invited, I was invited to go to North Carolina to give a talk, uh, and this, this is uh, already 40 years ago, no, uh, 30 years ago. And um, as a result, we continue working on the subject of control of cell proliferation of these cells, and or how these cells proliferate, or why. And eventually, we found ourselves in this uh, accident, laboratory accident, that we did not anticipate. As I mentioned before, we were interested in uh, isolating a, a, a chemical that is present in our bodies that have the function of inhibiting the proliferation of these cells. And in the process of uh, doing that, we have discovered, uh, let's say, a pathway whereby we could test the presence of this chemical uh, that is present in uh, our blood. So we continue for several years trying to do this. And one day, the experimental uh, uh, sample, as well as the normal sample, that used to find a difference, that difference disappeared. We explored what could have happened, and we realized that there was nothing that we did that was responsible for that uh, uh, um, lack of difference. So we started to explore what could have been. And uh, uh, at that point, the work stopped, and instead of continuing our research on, on this chemical, we started a new idea, a new line of investigation, trying to find out what was in the protocol and the, the way we uh, proceeded that was responsible for this thing that was unexpected. The love accident was uh, a very critical point in our research because all of a sudden we had to confront how to deal with something unexpected and we knew that what we were studying was the action of estrogens and all of a sudden it seemed like the contamination was contamination with the human uh, hormone, with estrogens. So uh, I would like to add to what Carlos said, that we had to check every component of our experiment, not only every component of the medium, but the pipettes we use, the tubes, etc., etc., to see where, where this contaminant was coming from. And after four months of work, we found that it was coming from the plastic tubes where we store components of the tissue cultural medium. So then uh, we called the manufacturers and said, well, we found estrogenic activity in your tubes. And they said, well, we never heard of that. So we said, well, do you know what it could be? And they said, well, we, before we answer that, we have to send you the, 
several batches and you will tell us where you find it. So we tested the four batches and we could trace it according to them to a change in the composition of the plastic. And their intention was just very good to make it more impact resistant. But with it came this estrogenicity. So he came to Boston to see us and we said, well, fine. I mean, it's good that we can trace it to the composition of uh, the, the, the plastic. So could you tell it? Could you tell us what is it? And they said, trade secret. But for the next one and a half year, we were purifying plastic tubes until we found the substance. And that substance turned out to be nonylphenol. Nonylphenol is a simple molecule that is widely used as an antioxidant. But that is one of the minor uses. There is another use that is much large volume, and that is that is the uh, is used in the synthesis of a detergents and industrial detergents that are still being used today. And so those detergents were already under scrutiny because they kill fish. And uh, in spite of knowing all this. Uh, they haven't been banned yet. Um, so that was a very shocking experience. It took, as I said, almost two years to go through the, all this. And then uh, together with what we learned in this meeting in North Carolina that was called Estrogens in the Environment, uh, we realized that the problem was uh, probably a lot more serious than just plastic lab lack laboratory where that it was something that humans would be exposed to. Let me, uh, the, the specific name of the, the, ter of the, con the chemical that we are talking about that was the contaminant in the, the laboratory uh, uh, tubes the centrifuge tubes is called N dash nonyl phenol. Yes, and it's a molecule that is widely used. It has many applications. One of the probably the um, largest volume application is that it's used in the synthesis of detergents. These detergents technically are called nonylphenol polyethoxylates and uh, they are used uh, mostly for industrial applications. In other words, you won't find this nonylphenol in your dish detergent, but it's uh, used, for example, to clean wool in the textile, in textile industry. It's used also in the cleaning of institutional cleaning, like hospitals. And it's also used, and there is where people can find it in the house, uh, as a, in, in, in the formulation of spermicidal chemicals. So for example, if you read in the condoms envelopes, it would say it contains non phenol Okay, polyethoxylate. So people are exposed to it, although it's not the detergent we use to wear, wash our dishes.